Hi there, everybody. It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, and good afternoon and ready for another Falcon 9 launch. It is the second Falcon 9 launch of this year, of 2018, which is awfully exciting, I think. Uh, we have supposedly about 30 SpaceX launches this year, uh, if all goes well, so we'll see. So fingers crossed, we have Falcon Heavy coming up here on Tuesday which I literally cannot wait for. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a pretty bog standard Falcon 9 mission anymore, and unfortunately it's getting overshadowed by Falcon Heavy. So, nonetheless, here's the rundown on this. This is a Falcon 9 launching from, uh, from uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. So this is actually at Slick 40, or Space Launch Complex 40, uh, which is their old, but then now kind of new again launch pad. Uh, this is a mission for the Luxem Luxembourg government um, for the GovSat-1 slash SES-16, which is a commercial partner. Um, and this is the second time that this exact booster, the Falcon 9 booster, has flown. So it first flew last year for NRO NROL-76 mission. Uh, so this is a reused core. That core landed back at Landing Zone 1 last year. They then refurbished it, and they are reflying it again. Now there's an important note here, everybody. This, uh, they will not be trying to even land or uh, catch or return this core. So um, there's a few reasons for this. A lot of it's speculation, guys. If you hear people saying it's this, this, and this, they might not know what they're talking about. But the biggest reason here, most likely, um, I believe, is that <laughs> uh, they actually have a ton of these uh, uh, three, uh, block three boosters. So this is the third iteration, uh, which is the, all the boosters they've landed so far are block three. They had block one way back in the day, uh, with no refurbishment attempts at all, no landing legs. Block two is where we started seeing landing legs. Block three is what we have been dealing with since 2015, uh, the end of 2015. Orbcom two was the first block three booster, and that was made to be landed. And we obviously saw them land, and they've been landing tons and tons and tons and tons of times. Um, as a matter of fact, they're to the point where I can't even keep track. I think they're, they've are they landed 18 or 19 cores now. So um, the point is, these Block 3 boosters are not meant to be reused over and over and over again. They're basically SpaceX learning how to land and then kind of seeing what it takes to refurbish a booster. Um, so that's what Block 5 will be. Now that Block 5 hopefully will be flying this year, they will be able to reuse them over and over and over again with the lessons learned from Block 3. So these Block 3 boosters, yes, they can land, yes, they can refly, but they won't really be reflying them over and over and over, per se. Um, so, that being said, they actually are literally running out of room to store these cores, because they just have them all over, and they aren't really being reused that often. And it does cost a lot of money to still return a core. Don't forget, they had to pay for crew to go out uh, and and be with the um, the drone ship, the uh, support crew. They have to pay for all the fuel. Um, they have to pay for a crew to unload the vehicle uh, once it gets back into port. There's so many things that has to happen uh, in order to actually... And then not only that, not only just for the recovering it, would maybe cost, who knows, a, a million dollars, two million dollars, whatever. Um, then if you want to refurbish it for flight, it's probably still cost ten million dollars or something, some unknown to us number. And eventually with Block 5, it will be cheap enough to be able to refly and refly over and over and over again. And it will make sense. Um, but for now, they actually have such a stock that they are just basically letting them fall into the ocean like a normal rocket would. Uh, they're still doing the landing burn. The, they're still doing the re-entry burn and the landing burn, and they're doing a soft touchdown in the ocean, but it will not be recovered at all. So that's what we're going to be, that's that's all we're going to be saying there about that, because it's, it's something that people ask all the time, why, why are they not recovering this one? It even has landing legs on it, and again, there's a lot of speculation about why would they throw away perfectly good landing legs? I have that question too, don't worry, you're not alone. Um, but the, the, the idea is most likely they're probably really testing things to the extreme um, on these ones that they're not even attempting to land. Um, they might actually be going in for extra hot re-entry. They might be reproducing um, speeds and profiles that only the Falcon Heavy might be entering or at or something like that. Um, they might be able to test it beyond, you know, if they didn't have the landing legs on the aerodynamic properties are much different. There's even people speculating, again, totally speculating here, um, totally just speculating that maybe they're even um, spreading the legs out a tiny bit during re-entry to help slow down during descent, but that's a dangerous assumption because as soon as you actually increase the drag, 
say by opening those legs a little bit, you're going that center of lift, that center of drag will want to be in the back. And having the landing legs at the back end of the vehicle is not ideal. So I don't know so much about that. Um, so we will see. Um, maybe they'll talk about that today, why they still have landing legs on it. And that's, yeah, so we'll see. Hopefully we'll hear more. Again, when I do these SpaceX launches, guys, I will be uh, trying to be quiet. <laughs> trying to be quiet while they talk so I can learn as well so we're going to be watching this together uh, think of it as your friend your your really ultra dorky friend sitting on the couch next to you watching it live um, and they are pedantically going shh, shh, shh while the person talks so I'll talk when I can but then we're going to let SpaceX talk when they can as well so how is everybody doing um, I hope everyone's doing great I got up way too early this morning for the live stream um, I got up at 4.30 a.m. Central to live stream the blue, oh gosh, the blue super blood moon lunar eclipse. And it went pretty well. It was too cloudy here. I didn't have the ability to, to actually live stream it with my own camera, the actual moon. So I just pulled up a feed from NASA. Um, and I also pulled up a feed from Griffith Observatory as well and kind of talked to people there. So, all right. So, um... How is everybody? So they are not even recovering at all, Guy Levy. Uh, that's right. So if you missed my rant, the, the five-minute rant, uh, watch this again on replay, and you will learn why exactly they are not recovering it. I don't think I want to talk about it again and again, because, yeah, um, there we go. <laughs> Let's see. What happens to this core? It will sink into the ocean. What about Block 4? Okay, so... Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of questions here about Block 3, Block 4, Block 5, and I will be doing a video about that soon, uh, hopefully lined up with, you know, when they do Block 5 finally. Block 4 is sort of a Frankenstein block. It's basically them using Block 3 cores and trying out different parts and pieces of Block 5 is sort of my understanding. That's not official. Um, that's just my best understanding of how that situation works. So, um, that being said, it's something like... You know, they, they might use the titanium grid fins like they did for the Iridium 2 Next mission um, earlier last year on a Block 3 core, but those are a Block 4 parts. They might be trying different heat shield and heat shielding elements or paint or different little little bits that make up Block 5. They're kind of testing out one at a time, I think, on Block 3. So Block 4 is not an official block. It's not like this is clearly a Block 4 rocket. Um, I think it's just them using Block 3 and then sticking some Block 4 parts on, so... Oh there, hi there, yo a new, sp a new sponsor, thank you so much. Welcome to being able to use some fun extra emotes. Um, it sounds like we need to let people know if you are looking for the most up-to-date, uh, how to stay up-to-date on SpaceX launches, there is nothing better than the SpaceX Now app uh, on your phone. So SpaceX Now, get it on your phone, whether it's Android or uh, iOS. But if you don't have an iPhone or an Android phone, you can also go to SpaceXNow.com. And the other option, too, there's also split SpaceFlightNow.com uh, for launch calendars. There's also Reddit. Make sure you're on the subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash SpaceX to stay very up to date with launches. That way you can find out any updates with, with Falcon Heavy, any updates with uh, any date changes and all that stuff, too. So... Yeah, we're, we're getting close here, guys. We're at T minus 20 minutes. I think I hear everything's fine. I haven't heard anything yet. So um, let's see here. And in our, we have an exclusive Discord channel for our Patreon members. So I want to thank you guys. Um, let's see. Rob Jones. Hi, you can't wait till Falcon Hovery. Well, <laughs> Hovey. Like I said, guys, it's been a long day. Hi, Tim. Can't wait till Falcon Heavy. Will I be covering it early? And Rob, thank you for your tip. And yes, the good news is I plan on record on, on hopefully going live about two hours before Falcon Heavy. Now I'll be three miles away from the launch pad, or yeah, from the launch pad. Um, I'll be sitting there at the Kennedy Space Center visitor, or not the visitor complex. I'll be at the press site, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun because it's a great view. There's just a little bit of water and then some trees off in the distance. You see the big countdown clock. I'll have the countdown clock right there in the background. Um, and I'll be able to answer your guys' questions. I'll be doing some fun other things leading up to that live stream. So it's going to be a really fun live stream. I'll probably even try to pull in some people and ask some questions to some other cool people. So make sure you're tuned in. Tune in plenty early. Falcon Heavy coverage will be through the roof. There will be an insane amount. So 
It'll be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, Falcon Heavy hype, guys. I cannot wait. So I hope that you join me for that. For that, I will be very early. Um, pull up two screens so you can see, you know, a phone and your and a, a computer, or a, your phone and a tablet, or a tablet and a TV or something. Um, put me up, and then put SpaceX's official launch up. You'll have an uncut feed from me, and you'll be able to see a really cool view. So I'm very, very, very excited. So I hope you guys are too. Um, let's see here. What time is the launch scheduled for? It is scheduled to launch in 19 minutes. So there we go. Um, any fresh info on BFR? Um, honestly, BFR is one of those things where we'll be happy to hear anything about it pre-IAC. And IAC is the International Aeronautical Congress. So that's when SpaceX... Um, it's, they've so far for the past two years, starting in 2016 and then again in 2017, is when they revealed the BFR. Um, they used to call it the Interplanetary Transportation System, um, but internally it's always been called the BFR, and that stands for Big Falcon Rocket. You can guess what the F might stand for internally. Um, and so far at this point, they've only been giving us, you know, for the past... Uh, for, they only give us an update really about once a year. We might see little things here and there about the engine or maybe about the carbon composites, but I don't think it's been really quiet in BFR camp because, you know, so far Falcon Heavy has taken over for BFR. So we will see. We will see. Um, I'm reminded in our, in, our desk, in our Discord channel that today is the 60 year anniversary of America's first satellite, Explorer 1. So that's the first time the United States was able to put a satellite into space. So congratulations, 60 years ago. Hopefully we have a beautiful launch today of a phenomenal rocket from SpaceX launching on its anniversary. It could be very, very special. So, and look at this. We have the live stream starting for SpaceX. I'm going to go ahead and pull them up there so we can keep track of it here. Once they go live, I will unmute them. I will mute my own music and we will tune into them and see them live. So get ready. So happy birthday, Explorer 1. You are 60 years old. Somebody asked, um, I, let's explain geostationary transfer orbit. So that's what this mission is. This is sending a, um, what is it, a 4,200 kilogram payload um, up to geostationary transfer orbit. So geostationary orbit is where a lot of communication satellites are. Um, they're the ones that are kind of pointed, like when you aim a satellite dish and you need to hit a specific place, that's what geostate, those are satellites that are in geostationary orbit. They basically end up looking like a star in the sky. They'll be a fixed point, and that's because their orbital period is 24 hours. So they actually stay in exactly 24 hour periods. They rotate with the Earth. So it's at this exact altitude, something like 22,000 miles um, or like 30,000 kilometers or so in altitude that these satellites stay. And in order to get there, um, instead of the, the booster, sending the upper stage sending the payload all the way out there and then circularizing what they do is they just simply get it out there to the highest point and then it's the payload's job uh the satellite has to have its own propulsion to actually circularize its own orbit so they just get it that's that's why it's called a transfer orbit so they're just transferring it they're doing the, the bulk bit of the work which is raising the orbit up to that geostationary point and then the satellite itself will actually circularize that orbit and get it into its proper geostationary orbit but otherwise, the, the job of the provider is just simply geostationary transfer orbit. So they just boop. And Rob Jones, thank you for the tip. And also, we have a new sponsor, everybody. It's Jesus Christ. Wow. I didn't know you were a fan, Jesus. Well, thank you and welcome. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. The music on the SpaceX live stream is, uh, we have this question in our Discord channel. Uh, the SpaceX live stream, they use Test Shot Starfish as their pre-launch uh, pre music. And again, currently I have them muted. We are listening to my own music just so it's something different. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good luck living up to the expectations of my new sponsor. <laughs> You're right. This will be difficult. I better take up carpentry very, very quickly. <laughs> That's awesome. But thank you. Thank you again for the, for the sponsor. All right, there. Hi, Tim. Hello from Denmark. Hello, Denmark. Did I buy the flamethrower? Maybe. Yes. 
Uh, <laughs> what block is the Falcon Heavy Center Core? Um, that's a good, good, good question. I believe the Center Core is basically going to still be based on Block 3 architecture, but it is entirely different. So, or, or mostly different. It is kind of its own thing when it's the Falcon Heavy uh, Core instead of a <laughs> instead of a Falcon 9 Core. So I don't know exactly. I'm sure it's based on on Block 3. Um, and I'm sure they're probably going to wait to launch another Falcon 9 until they start doing or another Falcon Heavy until they have Block 5 going. That's my guess. So, yeah, let's see here. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up with you guys. Um, oh, did they actually release the, the fire extinguisher? <laughs> I didn't realize they made the boring fire extinguisher. I thought that was a joke, too. You're right. It's not a flame floor. It's actually a torch. The flames do not get thrown onto things, which is probably a good thing in my case, because knowing me, I'd be like, yeah, and then I would shower this room in flames, and then I would end up dying, and that's not fun. Oh. Do I do I have a telescope? Is that a question? <laughs> I don't know. if Can you guys not see that? I think that's a telescope. <laughs> Hello, Gaten in our Discord channel. Let's see, sorry, I missed, that was a good one. Did they beef up the Falcon Heavy second stage? Yes! So the Falcon Heavy second stage has to be able to handle, uh, so the payload adapter is beefier to handle heavier payloads, and that also has to transfer into the second stage. So the upper stage of the Falcon Heavy is slightly different than a standard Falcon 9. It needs to be able to handle higher loads, but that being said, it's basically the same thing. It probably actually has, is actually less efficient because it has to be able to handle higher, lo higher loads, so it's probably heavier, which it takes a payload penalty for. Because remember, any pound that you add, here we go. I'm muting my music. I'm going to unmute their feed. Any pound that you add to the upper stage is a pound you have to subtract from your payload, so. All right, guys, so let's tune in here. See if they have any updates for us. Hey, Heike, thank you. Thank you for the tip. I'm hearing like 10 things right now. My brain hurts. I think it's their feed. That was interesting. You are looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket on Space Launch Complex 40, preparing for liftoff in just about 10 minutes from now at 425 Eastern or 925 Universal Time. Welcome to the live webcast of the GovSat-1 mission. It's the middle of the day here in Hawthorne, so people are gathered to watch the launch and making a bit of noise. Uh, I'm Michael Hammersley, a materials engineer in our avionics department. And today, SpaceX is making a second attempt at launching GovSat-1 into a geostationary transfer orbit from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, we scrubbed yesterday's launch attempt in order to replace a sensor on the second stage. Uh, today's launch window is about two hours long and we have a backup launch window at the same time tomorrow, starting again at 4.25 Eastern or 9.25 Universal Time. GovSat-1 is the first satellite of GovSat, which is a joint venture between the government of Luxembourg and leading satellite operator SES. Uh, SpaceX has a long and storied relationship with SES. We've launched four of their satellites, the first in 2013, and our first mission with a flight-proven booster launched uh, SES-10 uh, early in 2017. GovSat-1 is aimed exclusively at government and defense users, and it will operate along uh, the 21.5 degrees east longitude meridian. This makes it ideally positioned to provide highly reliable and flexible interconnectivity within Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. It will also enable maritime operations over the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Okay, so it looks like actually SpaceX might be having that audio sync issue currently uh, with their host, the audio syncing up with the video. Um, but hopefully that's on their end. If it is, uh, I, I apologize on their behalf. If it's on my end, I apologize on my behalf. I need to say thank you to Ar Arjan for the new sponsorship. Thank you. You, you now can see have the familiar fun markings from a re-entry on this Falcon 9. Uh, which first flew for NROL 76 in May of last year, launching from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, SpaceX now has three operational launch sites. Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy, 
Space Launch Complex 4 at Vandenberg, and the pad of today's launch, Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Stations. More launch sites allows SpaceX to launch more frequently, uh, which is a key step in achieving our goals of full and rapid reusability on our way to Mars. The unique markings that you see on the rocket uh, following re-entry are reflective of both the difference in temperature of the rocket's propellants and the proximity to the engines at the base of the first stage. We carry both liquid oxygen and rocket-grade kerosene, also called RP-1, on the rocket, um, but the liquid oxygen is super chilled, which changes how the soot and heat from the engines interacts with the surface of the rocket. Uh, where the stage is colder, soot isn't able to stick as well. Falcon 9 is a two-stage rocket, which means it has one stage to get out of the atmosphere and a second stage to get the satellite up to orbital speeds. Uh, the first stage has nine Merlin engines, which is why we call it Falcon 9, and is about two-thirds the overall height of the rocket. And the main job of that first stage is to get us out of the densest portion of Earth's atmosphere, and it will accelerate GovSat-1, as well as the second stage, to the edge of space at a few thousand miles per hour. At that point, uh, the first and second stage will separate. The second stage will continue accelerating GovSat-1 up to speeds of about 17,000 miles per hour. Uh, in today's mission, we will not be recovering the first stage. <laughs> OK, I need to real quick respond while I can. Um, first off, thank you, Michael Franz, for your tip, and thanks for saying you enjoy my live hosting and when I'm on tomorrow. Thank you for saying hi. Thank you, R. Zhao, for the new sponsorship. I really appreciate that. You now have some fun emotes. And greetings from February in Australia. I, that, that's crazy. It's, it's February already. Okay, hi. Hi, February. How is it? Um, <laughs> greetings uh, from... Let's check oh, in on Falcon oh, 9. Uh, the first stage helium load... Uh, and the second stage helium load began early this morning. Those are largely complete. Uh, the pad was cleared about <laughs> eight hours ago. A propellant loading began just over an hour ago, and RP-1 is now at about 99% full in both the first and second stages. A liquid oxygen load began 30 minutes ago, uh, and we are looking at about 95% complete in the first stage and 90% complete in the second stage. Uh, the range is currently a go, as well as the payload, which transitioned to internal power about 30 minutes ago. Uh, Weather-wise, we've been sending balloons up to gauge uh, the upper altitude winds, which are looking good. We've been keeping an eye on the thickness and height of some stratocumulus clouds. You can see them on the screen there. We don't want those clouds to be high enough or cold enough to form ice crystals, uh, but those aren't a concern for launch. Uh, engine chill began about four minutes ago. It's important to get the engines to the same temperature as the propellants so that the liquid oxygen does not suddenly turn into a gas upon contact with the much warmer plumbing, among other things. Okay, I'm going to try to sneak in here quick. Uh, thanks to our new sponsor, Satan from Hell. <laughs> we are now sponsored officially by Jesus Christ and Satan from Hell. So thank you, Satan from Hell. Uh, Timothy Buzelli, yeah, you just found this channel a few days ago. You're, you think my videos are great, and you are welcome. Uh, we've got several mem members of the GovSat1 team in Florida to watch today's launch of GovSat1. Uh, in particular, we would like to extend a warm welcome to the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of Luxembourg, as well as their Royal Highnesses, the Prince and Princess of Luxembourg, uh, all of whom are watching today's launch in person from Florida. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, designed exclusively to address governmental and institutional security user needs, uh, GovSat-1 is the first satellite of GovSat, uh, which is a public-private partnership between the government of Luxembourg and world-leading satellite operator SES. The public-private partnership is unique in that it allows governments to take advantage of the lower costs associated with commercial satellites while still meeting governmental security needs. Okay. I don't think we're going to watch this. I'll go ahead and turn this down. Um, we, we know all this stuff, and we can watch that later. 
All right. So uh, first off, thank you so much, Valentino. Uh, I'm glad that you I, that means a lot that your family watches my videos. That genuinely means a lot. They are meant to be watched by families. So that's why they're family friendly. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact that you're that you're here and tipping. So thank you. Um, Emil, uh, Emiliano. Hello from Mexico. I'm your favorite YouTuber. Thank you so much. The tip means a lot. Thank you. Um, so the it seems like, yeah, again, the the feed right now on SpaceX is a little bit off. There's a little audio resync. Maybe we'll take this time real quick and I'm gonna go ahead and refresh this feed, which means it's going to pop like this. And we'll see if that fixes the audio sync issue. Oh, cool. Or it just turns into a black screen. How about while I do this, I'm gonna do this just so it doesn't look absurd. Where did it, what? What? Okay, I'm working on it, guys. Troubleshooting, we're gonna reload. Somebody give me a reload. Okay, here we go. We're back. Loading up the helium that's uh, pressurizing the first and second stages. And we're in the very final stages of liquid oxygen and RP-1 loading. Uh, by loading those propellants so close to launch, we can keep them very cold. Uh, and being denser, that means we can load a little bit more of each of those propellants onto the vehicle. We're also performing some final communications checks with the uh, full Falcon 9 and also testing the thrust vector control system, which basically wiggles the engines to make sure that those are properly able to steer uh, Falcon 9 during ascent. Uh, we are preparing for Falcon 9 to take full control of the rest of launch. And the spacecraft is still a go for launch. At this point, uh, we're just coming up on about T minus three minutes before launch. Uh, let's listen in to the last few minutes of terminal count. Okay, so again, to clear up real quick, they are not recovering this so booster again. This booster has been flown before on NRO, NROL 76 last year. Uh, it landed at LZ1. And this, they could land this booster. Uh, let's be clear about that. This is only a 4,200 kilogram satellite going to geostationary transfer orbit. They've launched a lot heavier satellites than that and still recovered them. So um, they should, they could recover this, but this is a block three booster. They are only meant to be flown once or twice. Um, and again, block three was really only meant to figure out how to land and how to recover what it takes to refurbish. And then they apply all those lessons learned into block five. So at this point, they have so many of these cores that it's almost becoming to the point where they're taxing them. And they're actually like, not taxing like money, but it's taxing to keep them all around. So at this point, it's honestly, uh, apparently, to, according to SpaceX, of their best interest to start just kind of getting rid of someone, which seems crazy, but I, I trust in their decisions. I trust in their accounting. So, And Jesse Clark, you, thank you so much for the tip. That means a lot. And hello. Thank you. Stage two locks load is closed out. So again, congratulations to Luxembourg for your GovSat 1. That's very cool. It's sharing a, 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 a the bird here with SES-16. Um, do I know Falcon Heavy's mission objectives? Yes, it is just a demonstration mission. So it's going to be trying to send Elon Musk's personal Tesla uh, towards Mars in an elliptical Mars orbit that goes out to the... Uh, the orbit will go out to where Mars Vehicles is, but it won't go to Mars. It won't land, it won't be in Mars orbit, but it will be in an elliptical orbit around the sun. All this venting you see here is normal, guys. Um, all this smoke, this is as the tanks get pressurized with super dense oxygen and... and uh, which is liquid oxygen and uh, propellant, the liquid oxygen boils off because when it turns from um, a, a liquid state and then warms up from the ambient yeah, air and turns back into... Yeah, just listening here. And turns back into a gas that expands. And so they have valves that open so it doesn't expand and rupture the tank. Start Instead it gets vented into the air. And the very cold uh, condenses and, and makes water vapor. So that's what you're actually seeing is the water vapor interacting with the very, very, very cold... Um, oxygen coming out of the vehicle. So that's normal. Nothing to be worried about. Go for it's lunch. breathing. <laughs> um, no, Paul, NRO, NROL 76 was not extra spicy. Uh, NROL was, was very easy. It came in for a beautiful landing. That's one of the best tracking cameras we've Last ever three seen seconds. Um, as it comes back for return to launch site landing. So um, we'll talk about some of these. Remind me to, to answer questions about what would happen if Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy fails, what effect that would have on Falcon 9. But I'm going to tune into the launch here, guys. We're at T minus 14 seconds. Ryan, thank you. 
It's most likely to go through the NASA and SpaceX. I'll let eight, you know. Here seven, we go, guys. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. Yes. Yes. We have lift off. Look at that. Every time. Every time. And that is the camera shaking from over three miles away on top of the vehicle assembly building. That's how much power these things have. Gosh, it still gets me every time. Look at that. It is cruising along already, guys. It's already three kilometers in altitude. And there you saw a successful liftoff of the Falcon 9. Uh, stage 1 propulsion all looking nominal. Beautiful clear shot of Falcon 9 ascending through the Florida sky there. Um, about to go through supersonic. You may now. see a sonic boom with this sort of clear sky. That's cool. I didn't realize you'd actually see a sonic product. boom on ascent. Uh, coming up shortly, we're about to enter max Q. Uh, that's the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure when the rocket is pushing hardest against the atmosphere. That's an awesome shot. Remember, this this core has already been flown. This Vehicle is the fifth or sixth queue. reuse of a core. We've successfully plat passed through that point. That's always a major milestone in, in every rocket launch. And notice the exhaust plumes get wider and wider and wider as the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner because those exhaust gases are uh, just extremely high, high the second pressure stage so it engine spreads out uh, as the, the atmosphere gets thinner. same reason that we chill the first stage engine to make sure that it's ready to be at the, the right temperature, the same temperature as the propellant. Um, coming up about 30 seconds from now, we're going to have a few events in quick succession. The first stage engines are going to cut off. The two, st Recovery vessel has AOS. The two stages will separate and the second stage will ignite. They just said recovery vessel is AOS. Maybe the fairing recovery. Maybe they're still going for fairing recoveries today, guys. You can see the, the plumes fading away as the rocket is, is getting out of the atmosphere. Trajectory is still looking good. And those uh, three events, uh, main engine cutoff, separation, and second stage ignition. Yes. Happening right now. Okay. Wait, Miko. There we go. Stage separation. And engine ignition. Uh, and that thing that falls off is normal. And there like you the saw it. Uh, first stage successfully it cut off. The two stages off. separated, and then the second stage has begun its burn. Um, you saw the retaining ring fall away, and that retaining protects ring. the MVAC, uh, Merlin vacuum engine nozzle during shipping. Um, uh, again, we are not recovering the first stage on this mission, uh, but we are about uh, 30 seconds away from fairing deploy. Uh, the fairing protects the satellite during ascent, but it's not necessary once you get out of the atmosphere, and so we'll let it fall back to Earth uh, to keep that propellant available to loft more satellite. I still, they might be trying to recover the fairings. We'll talk about Fairing that in a separation second. Confirmed. Sweet. We've got confirmation of the fairings uh, separating. You can see one of the fairing halves in the, in the screen behind the second stage engine there. All right, we're looking good, guys. Um, Beautiful clear shot of second stage against the Earth background. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. The upper stage now has acquisition of signal of a different tracking station, ground station. Okay, so. Uh, trajectory for stage two is still nominal. Uh, this burn is going to continue for about another four minutes, uh, at which point the second stage will then uh, turn off its engine and have a coast phase for about 17 minutes. Uh, it'll be in a parking orbit at that time, uh, and it'll, the coast phase will be uh, preparing for the 
second burn, which will uh, push the satellite into its geostationary transfer orbit. So I'll be talking during that coast phase, there's a 17 minute long phase, where we can catch up on all this stuff. You guys can ask all the questions you have leading up to this point. I'll make sure and answer them. It's a good time to be able to kind of refresh on all these things like fairing recovery. Um, we can talk about why they aren't recovering the first stage today. Um, we can talk about all that stuff. So bear with me, I, I don't about wanna talk plus over them. five minutes and 20 seconds at the moment. At about this time, the, the first stage would be on its way back to the drone ship. Uh, and it's weird, weirder to consider that we're not actually recovering this one. Uh, SpaceX has landed, I think it's about 20, 20 first stages at this point. And the goal is for each first stage to last tens of launches in the, first, in the short term and hundreds or thousands of launches uh, in the long term. T plus six minutes and 15 seconds. Trajectory still looking nominal. And that second stage burn going to continue for another uh, two minutes or so. Stage one A of TSS saved. Stage one entry burn has started. So again, they're still going through the re-entry and landing process, even though there's nothing to catch stage it. Stage two so. continuing along nominal trajectory. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about that here in a second. Again, everybody, we will be talking about why they aren't landing it and here in a second as soon as, as soon as they go into that coast phase. I will talk about it plenty again, so we'll reiterate that. So don't uh, worry. You just heard the call out that the stage one had its entry burn uh, start and then shut down. Um, while we are uh, having a re-entry burn, we are not recovering the first stage. T plus seven minutes and 20 seconds. Second stage propulsion and trajectory all still looking nominal, just the way we like it. And about one minute remaining in this first burn to get to a low altitude parking orbit for GovSat-1. Stage one is transonic. Transonic means going from supersonic to subsonic. So above the speed of sound to oh, below LOS, the speed of sound. Cape Canaveral stage one, as expected. Loss of acquisition of signals, LOS. Stage two is under terminal guidance. Stage two, AFTS has saved. We're about 30 seconds away from uh, the second engine cutoff event. You'll be able to see that on your screen. And again, guys, I will talk about all this stuff uh, when there's a break here. So stay tuned. Stage one landing burn has started. The legs have deployed. Stage and one. stage one splashdown. My stage one. We hope yes, you. And we have Seiko, second engine cutoff. Second stage engine cutoff. So they'll probably go into a coast period here where I can talk and explain Hello, some Steve things. Canaveral stage two, as expected. Uh, you, you may have heard that the, uh, the first stage had its splashdown. Again, that was not a recovery of the first stage. That was a, an expected splashdown. Uh, the second engine cutoff event um, was confirmed, uh, as well as a good parking orbit. And then you can see a uh, second stage in space, coasting in that parking orbit. It'll be doing that for about another 17 minutes or so, at which point the second stage will burn for about another minute to change it from that low altitude parking orbit into the geostationary transfer orbit. We're gonna take a break during that time, but you can see the progress of the second stage on the animation on your screen, uh, currently a, a few hundred miles uh, east of the Florida coast. Uh, we'll be resuming coverage at about T plus 
uh, 25 minutes or so. So stay tuned, and we'll see you shortly. Okay, we're going to kind of pop them up in the corner and pay attention here. I'm going to lower their volume. Okay, we have a lot of questions. First off, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, Ryan Gardner, I have to answer your question still. And Wervan Var, Van Vaughn, thank you for your tip. And Guilo Birdie, we will be talking about that in a second here. So Ryan, uh, what's my the most optimistic goal for both NASA and SpaceX for this year? Um, I think they share a very common goal. They want to get commercial crew developed as far along as humanly possible. So don't forget NASA and SpaceX, as well as Boeing and United Launch Alliance, um, are working to get crews back to the International Space Station launching from the United States on U.S. rockets. That's huge. So SpaceX will be, they're continually getting their um, their Dragon 2 crew capsule ready, um, and that will be launching astronauts. They were aiming for the end of the year. I'm not so sure it'll happen this year. It might be early next year before they actually get astronauts on board for the first flight. But we will see um, NASA and SpaceX developing the Dragon 2 uh, and getting it ready for that first crew um crew flight and that's something that they do in comp they do together so nasa has these kind of checkpoints and spacex then needs to um go ahead and um and fulfill those checks so uh that's something that nasa and both spacex uh that's definitely one of their goals and i think the most optimistic goal would be to see uh, one of those two providers either boeing or spacex be the first one to send humans up to the international space station for the first time since 2011 from the united states um, from U.S. soil. Don't forget, U.S. astronauts are still flying right now through Russia on the Soyuz vehicle. So, uh, and and uh, Guilio, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Why does the second stage fire twice? So right now it's in what's called a parking orbit. So it's actually just in low Earth orbit essentially, right? And what they need to do is they wait until it's halfway around the, the Earth, and then they light up that engine one more time, and they expand its orbit. So if you speed up at any point in an orbit, say you speed up right here, and you're in a circle orbit, it will, what will happen is it will raise the opposite side of the orbit. So all of a sudden, you'll get into this elliptical orbit. It'll look kind of egg-shaped. It'll look oblong. And so that's what geostationary transfer orbit is, is they first park it, and then it's meant to actually expand and get out to its point where it needs to start... Um, they, they spread out, so they have to get to the back side in order to raise the orbit to its intended destination. And this one's parking, I don't remember what degree, like 21 degrees or something to service um, Luxembourg and, and that portion of the world. So it has to go to the, so it has to go out there behind it basically and then expand its orbit. And then once it detaches the payload, then the payload itself has thrusters to circularize its orbit. That's the kind of the key there. So this is only a geostationary transfer orbit and that's why the engine ignites twice is to park first and then pff, get it injected into its proper geostationary transfer orbit. Okay, so we need to talk about why didn't they land that first stage, Tim? Why did they waste it? It's a waste of money, right? Um, so here's the deal, guys. Again, this this booster has already flown once. It flew last year on NRO, NROL 76. It landed back at Cape Canaveral, LZ1. You can watch the video after this. Go ahead and find Type in NROL 76 or look through all their streams from last year. They had 19 launches, I think, uh, or 18, 19, something like that. Um, so you can find it. It's the only one that is named NROL. Uh, find that one, click on it, watch it. Um, that was the same booster that was just flown this time. And these boosters, all the boosters that have landed so far, all the boosters that are currently flying, uh, used or, or, or brand new, are Block 3 boosters. Block 3 boosters are boosters that... Um, are their current generation and again they basically are trying they learned how to land they learn how to recover and they learned what it takes to refurbish block three um, from this generation of vehicles and these generation of vehicles aren't necessarily meant to be reused over and over and over you heard them in the live in the broadcast they said they're working on having something on having the falcon 9 be reused 10 to tens uh to hundreds of times uh, that's their eventual goal for the Falcon 9, and especially BFR plans to be reused hundreds, if not thousands of times. Um, so that's, they're applying the lessons learned to Block 3 um, into Block 5. So Block 5 will be very much so rapidly reusable and reused over and over and over and over. Um, that being said, they literally have warehouses full of these landed boosters that can only really, they, they require a lot of refurbishment. They really aren't meant to be reflown over and over and over again. They they just simply aren't meant to do that. So I think SpaceX is, has decided they're they're going to just be reflying them once and then they're ditching them in the ocean. This is the second time they did it. They did it earlier this year. Um, I think, was it an Iridium flight that they did that for? Iridium Next 4, I believe, um, was expended 
as well. Just trying to literally almost clear up inventory, a fire sale, if you will. But they still got a reuse out of it. And, and as, as they make room for um, Block 5 and all that stuff, it's literally not worth them paying the millions of dollars to go and recover it because it still costs a lot to recover these things. You know, you have to pay for the crew and the gas and the boat and the drone ship and the tugboat and then the uh, recovery crew and then the transportation fees and then the refurbishment fees, all the stuff. It's still millions of dollars to actually do that. And so at this point, if it's literally just going to be sitting in a warehouse somewhere, it's just better off to let it go into the ocean like a normal, normal rocket. So, and, um, uh, Horace, beautiful. How the Earth moves under the second stage. It is beautiful. So now the second stage is traveling at basically 17,500 miles an hour, 27,000 kilometers an hour. And we get to watch it. It's cruising along. It will orbit every 90 minutes. The next thing we need to talk about, we had a lot of questions. Um, we will, we'll talk about that, the sideways thing. That was a good question. Why do rockets go sideways? Uh, we will talk about that here in a second. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is fairing recovery. So they have been working on recovering the fairing. And the reason why is Elon has said, it's basically imagine a pallet of $6 million falling from the sky. Wouldn't you try to catch that? Um, apparently, you know, those, those fairings, we, we can see those pictures from inside. Um, we can see the, the pictures of the fairings, uh, really good pictures from the fairings for the pictures that they release of the Tesla that they're going to be launching on Falcon Heavy. They have awesome pictures of those, of those payload fairings. They're huge. They can fit a school bus inside those payload fairings. And they're made out of carbon fiber and have all these crazy, you know, really expensive aerospace grade components inside them. So they're very, very, very expensive. So what they're working on doing, and uh, we have yet to see them successfully do it, but they're just kind of trying it under the table and not really letting us know. Um, the two fairings, they separate kind of like two clamshells. They go like this, pfft, and then they're very lightweight. I mean, they're relatively lightweight. They have a very big surface area. So when they re-enter, so they end up just falling back to Earth. You know, they follow the, the, the parabola, um, very similar parabola to the first stage. The first stage kind of comes up and then re-enters the atmosphere and then lands sometimes. And the, the fairings are not, not much later than that. So they deploy about 30 seconds after stage separation, which means they are a little bit further down range. Um, but they're also very lightweight, so they can actually survive re-entry. They just put the the kind of the, the curved shape towards the atmosphere using some nitrogen thrusters. We saw excellent footage of that from the... Uh, what mission was that? Was that... Uh, that might have been that Iridium Next 4 mission as well, that one that looked like a crazy UFO in California. Um, you could see the little puffs of nitrogen coming from the fairings even um, as they work on orienting them. So they come through the atmosphere um, facing their correct direction, their correct orientation. And then they fall and they, they survive re-entry. And at, once they get to a certain part of the atmosphere, they actually release parachutes that are like paragliding parachutes. And they surf on them using a parachute and then still the control thrusters. And they're able to do a pinpoint landing. They, they've for sure mentioned before that they've actually been able to do a pinpoint landing hitting their GPS target uh, multiple times now, I believe. Um, that's even way back, I think, SES-10 or CR, CRS-12, they talked about the, the attempts at fairing recovery. So they've been working on this for about a year now almost. So it sounds like they had some ships out there. Um, here we go. My Discord channel brought up excellent uh, excellent pictures of the... Let me get this kind of prepped here. How do I best open this without making a, f a fool of the world? Send me a, a link. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to drag that over there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how they're working on fairing recovery. And again, $6 million, I think that sounds quite worth trying to recover. Um, it's been difficult, but it's not as, it's, there's no big explosions, at least if it goes wrong, like it would, you know, the first stage trying to land. Um, and fairings, uh, great thing here, uh, banana phone, oh, wait, banana phone, what is a fairing? And somebody kind of began to explain it. So, um, they, uh, the, <laughs> I almost said the banana phone. The fairing is there to protect that satellite uh, from the atmospheric pressure. Uh, as it's, you know, as the rocket's going through the atmosphere, there's a lot of pressure on there, a lot of uh, strong aerodynamic forces. You know, imagine sticking your hand out of the window at a car going 100 miles an hour. Well, the rocket is already going 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers an hour within seconds of liftoff, and it just goes faster and faster. But the altitude. Uh, as it gains altitude, the atmosphere also gets thinner and thinner. So that's why there is a point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, or max Q. That's because the rocket's still accelerating, 
But the atmosphere is getting thinner and thinner, and there's a point where those two things intersect. And it's and during that period, they actually throttle back because there's a lot of pressure. And then from then on, the atmosphere is so thin, even as the vehicle accelerates, it gets into a thinner and thinner atmosphere. So they can basically punch the engines again. Once they get way out of the atmosphere, it's okay for them to deploy the fairing, and that ends up uh, you know, exposing the payload to the uh, to the rigors of outer space. And so these um, spacecraft are meant to be in space. They are not meant to be in our atmosphere. So that's why they're protected inside that payload fairing. That's the long answer there. Uh, I hope that helps. That's what a payload fairing is. That's why they have it. That's what it does. We'll talk about payload fairing recovery probably when we learn more. So, all right. Um, so let's see, what else did we have? We had a lot of questions. Um, why didn't the rocket engine go green like last time? It always does the, I don't know if you're talking about the actual, uh, nozzle, the engine nozzle on the upper stage. It never quite goes green. It ch changes funny colors, but you will see before ignition of any, uh, SpaceX launch, they use this thing called T-TEB, triethyl aluminum, triethyl borane, which is, um, two hypergols. Uh, I believe they're hypergolic or maybe they're just, they might not be hypergolic. So I don't remember what the word is for that. But um, two, two things that when they come in contact, they're extremely flammable and they ignite and then they use that to ignite the engines. So you'll see this green flash before the engines ignite and that's because of T-TEB. Okay, so is there a vacuum in the fairing? Um, that's a good, I don't think the, the fairings actually have a full pressure, like pressurized or unpressurized. Um, I think they're just more, uh, I don't think they're fully pressurized. So I don't think there's a vacuum in there, but I might be wrong. Actually, that's a great question. Uh, they are hypergolic. There we go. <laughs> um, sorry, how's that? Oh, Rocket Man, how's the recording going? I, I'm working on a video explaining where you can watch Falcon Heavy from. Uh, I spent several hours shooting it uh, in between the two live streams that I had today. I'll have to finish it up here after today's live stream. And then I have to edit it before I head down to Falcon Heavy. Uh, again, a quick reminder, I will be at Falcon Heavy Launch in person. Yes, so I will be down there. I will be at the press site. Um, I will be three miles away from Falcon Heavy. I will be live streaming using this Blackmagic 4K studio camera. So expect some really good views from three miles away. I will be live streaming about T minus two hours. So there'll be plenty of time for me to answer all your fun questions. Um, for those of our patrons that are Patreon members, I will be doing a meetup at Falcon Heavy at some point, uh, hopefully a dinner or some kind of meal with patrons. So stay tuned to Patreon if you guys are Patreon supporters. Um, also, I may be, if I have time, and I'm dead serious about the if I have time thing, it's a crazy schedule. Uh, if I have time, I'll try to do a public meetup as well if you guys wanna come hang out. So, okay. Um, okay, there we go, uh, Versti. Why do rockets go sideways? That's a great, great, great question. So. Um, the only reason rockets go up at all is actually just to get out of our atmosphere for the most part. If you were standing on the highest point, like on a mountain, on the highest point on the moon, and you shot like a gun or a rocket fast enough straight sideways, um, as long as it's in, at orbital speeds, it'd come straight back around and end up right where it's right where it started. So if you didn't duck and if you waited 20 or 30 minutes, however long it takes to do one orbit, uh, yeah, you would end up getting shot by that bullet. So it has, so getting, so orbital speeds, it's, it's speed that matters to stay into orbit. The reason that they go up at all is to get out of the atmosphere. Just like here on earth, if you're running, biking, if you're on a motorcycle or a car or even an airplane, you know that the wind will slow you down. That atmosphere creates a lot of drag and slows you right back down. And so rockets go up first to get out of the atmosphere. That's the primary reason they go up. But soon, almost immediately after liftoff, they begin what's called a gravity turn because the important part of getting into orbit isn't going up. To actually stay into orbit, you have to be going sideways. So you have to be going 17,500 miles an hour, 22,000 or 27,000 kilometers an hour, horizontal like this uh, around the earth. And the reason for that is that's the speed where you're going outwards as fast as the earth is pulling you down. I know that's kind of hard to imagine, but imagine if you're throwing a football or a basketball or a baseball, a ball, I'll just say a ball. You throw a ball, it arcs. Say you throw a ball further, it arcs a little bit further. And if you keep doing that, if you kept throwing it harder and harder, eventually you could get to the point, If again, if you're at the highest point where you throw it so far, the arc actually encompasses the entire earth and comes back around and it just stays there. So as long as there's nothing to slow it down, like our pesky atmosphere, it'll stay in orbit. 
Uh, Rob Jones, thank you so much. Great script on Discord discuss discussing where to launch. Well, I'm glad that you gave it a read through. That really means a lot. Also, I think I missed Justin Zobel's tip. Thank you, Justin and Paul. Thank you guys so much for the tip. That really means a lot. Um, why can't they... Let's see here. Why can't they do the second burn of the second stage right away? The satellite was circularized anyway. Uh, so the Earth periapsis, why, why does it really matter? That's actually a really, really good question. Um, I think it actually, believe it or not, I, I don't for sure know the answer to this, but I think a lot of it has to do with they want to launch um, for geostationary orbits like this. They want to launch it so that the long, slow coast phase is in, in the daylight side and it's not at all in any risk of being behind the Earth. So it has time to deploy solar panels and gain charge. Also, I think it makes the most sense for its... Um, oh, they're back. In the final stages of the coast phase of the second stage, and um, the final parts of that coast phase, I, I suppose, uh, the uh, liftoff of Falcon 9 occurred on time at uh, 1.25 Pacific this afternoon, 4.25 Eastern. Uh, successfully uh, lifted second stage and the GovSat 1 into a parking orbit. And we're about to begin a second burn of the second stage that'll last about one minute. Uh, to get it into a geostationary transfer orbit. Uh, second stage is currently at 245 kilometers in altitude, and geostationary uh, orbits are at 36,000 kilometers in altitude. So this burn is going to uh, move GovSat into that higher space. Uh, that second stage burn is coming up just a few moments from now. And there we have it, a second stage ignition for the second burn. And that will uh, greatly Restart increase ignition. the final altitude uh, of the GovSat-1 in order for it to be able to move itself into the correct position at 36,000 kilometers. Oh, we've moved so far east at this point. We're just off the western coast of Africa that we're very much in nighttime, which is why you can no longer see uh, Earth in the background. That second stage burn continuing for a few more seconds. And then we have shutdown. Uh, we'll take a few moments to confirm that we're in the correct geostationary transfer orbit. And then a few minutes to make sure that the satellite is GNC healthy. GNC confirms good orbit insertion. And we just got confirmation that the uh, geostationary transfer orbit is in fact good. Which is just the way we like it. Uh, we're going to take a, a few minutes now to make sure that the payload is healthy and prepare for that payload deploy, which is the final step of uh, the mission for SpaceX. That payload deploy is coming up in a few minutes from now, so we'll take a quick break. Uh, but stay tuned. And at about T plus uh, 32 minutes, we'll cut back in to show what we can of the payload deploy. Awesome. Okay, first off, thanks, Benjamin Churchill. Thank you for the tip. That's greatly appreciated. Um, okay, and let me do this again. I'll try to remember to flip it back. I apologize, everybody. Um, so we have a few more questions. Uh, the tin foil is a protective foil against uh, to keep the sun from warming up those the the fuel tanks and all that stuff. I believe I'm not actually entirely positive why they have the foil there, but I think that's correct. Somebody let me know for sure. Um, and the frozen material you see those are the vent caps for the again. Remember, there's that that very highly pressurized liquid oxygen, and you're actually seeing liquid oxygen uh, boiling off, and then. It's in the freezing temperatures of space, so it ends up crystallizing and turning into solid oxygen. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, thank you, Benjamin Churchill, and thank you, Chris. Thank you. I will try to keep up the good work. How do they live stream from space? They have a ground station, so occasionally you'll see downlink 
uh, failed where they don't have a ground station that has communication with the upper stage. And we actually just saw it there for one second. It went to uh, no downlink. So that's how they are able to live stream cameras um, from space using tra ground tracking stations, satellites that relay the information. So, okay, so um, foil blanket is for thermal regulation, Neuropilot in our Discord. Thank you. Okay, we had a few more questions. Uh, what happens if the cameras on sec on stage two? Why don't they live cast re-entry? Uh, there's a lot of, I don't think there's any reason to. It's very fiery, and I bet that second stage burns up pretty quickly in the upper atmosphere as it does re-entry. So, um, oh somebody, oh sorry, uh, that's right. Also, DJT twenty four twelve. Are they dumping their rubbish in the ocean? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, the second stage and anything else does end up getting um, lost into the ocean. But believe it or not. Uh, they actually kind of take preparations for that for wildlife, for marine wildlife. And a lot of rocket stages actually have designed, I don't know if SpaceX in particular does this, but some other stages are meant to have little preparations to help coral attach to them because they literally plan on them being uh, beds for, for animals. So, I mean, if that's some consolation, I hope it is. Um, how many second stages are still in orbit? Probably a lot. Um why so fast? So the the reason it's so going so quickly right now, stage two, is because um, right now the you speed up again. Remember that orbit where we talked about making it el elliptical, where one point ends up going uh, an elliptical orbit, where it's the lowest points kind of close to Earth and the highest points far away from Earth. In order to get to that point, oh, in South Africa, and um, the next major event and the last important one for the mission. Uh, for SpaceX is the payload deploy step when we release the satellite from the second stage and allow it to continue on its geostationary transfer orbit at which point it will uh, circularize its orbit at 36,000 kilometers uh, at 21.5 degrees east. And that payload deploy is, is going to look just like a, a gentle push away from the second stage and uh, it looks like we'll be having good live video of that that payload deploy event coming up in just about 10 seconds from now. Once it deploys, that's the end of SpaceX's mission, by the way. There we go. Space up. Space cross separation confirmed. And there we have it. A successful SpaceX's deploy mission is of the payload, nice and smooth, and confirmed separation, just the way we like it. Um, that concludes uh, the live webcast and SpaceX's portion of today's mission. Uh, thank you very much to GovSat1 and SES uh, for choosing us for this launch. Thank you to the Range and FAA for your support, and thank you for tuning in to watch today's mission. If you'd like to join us on our mission here at uh, launching satellites and getting to Mars, uh, check us out at spacex.com careers. Otherwise, look for further updates on our social media accounts, uh, including for Falcon Heavy, uh, which is currently targeted for February 6th. Thanks again for joining us. Okay, guys. They did it. Another successful mission. Cheers, SpaceX. Uh, good luck, SES and GovSat. I will stick around here for a little bit longer and answer your guys' questions. Let's just do this. We can just cut this guy here. Um, and we'll pull this back up. So, um, let's see. We have a lot of good questions. First off, uh, Bart, thank you for the tip. Uh, Cardinal Slinky, thank you for the new sponsorship. Brent, if I had a chance, would I go to Mars? Um, I've said this a few times before, and I'm happy to answer this question because it's I, I'm not an explorer. I would not want to go on anything. I wouldn't want to be like the Christopher Columbus of sailing the ocean where you're on this rickety ship and half your crew dies and there's a good chance you're just going to plain be dead. I want to be lazy uh, tourist on a cruise ship now, you know, where it's safe where you don't have the fear that it might you might die, where it's not a big deal to hop on the ship, go to Mars, hang out maybe for a year or something if you want to, vacation, and then come home. I'm not someone that I don't want to colonize, I don't want to be one of the first, um, but I'll gladly just be a space tourist. So that's my answer. Uh, let's see, uh, and from Hueo, uh, Falcon Heavy launch is scheduled for Tuesday, uh, February 6th. If you guys want to know any updates on any SpaceX launch, including Falcon Heavy, when's it going to launch? If any changes happen, if you have the SpaceX Now app on your phone, 
you will be as up to date as I am because they do a great job of keeping those launches up to date. They have official tweets from Elon and SpaceX. Um, they have official news updates from Reddit as well. It's, it's easily the best and simplest way to get all of your SpaceX information. So there you go. Tip of the day. And Sindri, thank you so much. Where can you buy one of these small spinning globes? These are Mova globes. They are Mova International. Um, I think we have a Nightbot thing for that. The mods will hopefully pop a few of those are there. So um, yeah, there you go. Mova International. They run on solar, pow uh, solar, pa <laughs> solar power. Uh, and basically there's like solar panels inside there and like magnets and a little, earth. I don't quite know how it works, but it's pretty amazing. So there we go. Okay, that's true guys, it's official. The next launch is now Falcon Heavy. How ex I am very excited. Again, quick reminder, I will be there and I will be uh, streaming live from the press site about three miles away with, with very good access. Um, and I'll hopefully um, be able to live stream for about two hours leading up to the launch. So get ready, bring lots of good questions. Hopefully I'll be able to bring some people in and other experts and other um, space people along to ask them questions. It'll be a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, get ready for that. Again, make sure if you aren't subscribed here, make sure you are so that you know when I go live for Falcon Heavy because it will be amazing. And I'm actually taking, again, my Blackmagic Studio 4K, uh, this camera here, which is an, uh, my live streaming camera. That will be coming with me, so you get very good quality as well. So don't you worry, guys. Um, I've had a few people ask um, if I will be attending IAC this year in Germany. I am planning on it. I need to get that all figured out, obviously, and I... I'll have to find a way to be able to pay for myself to get there because it's kind of expensive, but I will for sure try to make it. Uh, so plan on me, Germany, plan on me coming and saying hi. Eldon, thank you for the tip. Is Raptor planned for launch on a later Falcon Heavy? Um, for those of you who don't know, Raptor is their next methane powered engine. Uh, it's about three times more powerful than the Merlin engine, despite being almost the same size as the Merlin engine. Very similar in size. And there are no plans that I've heard of for sure uh, there are no real plans, I don't think, to actually have a Raptor ever be on the Falcon vehicle. That could change. I don't know. It would be a great test bed for SpaceX to use, like, say, the upper stage um, to be able to test out a Raptor vacuum engine or something like that. But I still have not heard that. So we will see. And wow, thank you, guys. Uh, Guido, thank you for the sponsorship. You are awesome. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, you're welcome. I'm happy to cover these events and help answer questions whenever I can so thank you very much and Gavin thank you so much well thank you that really means a lot I'm glad that you appreciate my videos um, we put a lot of hard work into them again I need to owe uh, a special thanks to my patrons in our exclusive discord channel um, those patrons that help they get to see the scripts ahead of time I listen to their feedback they help correct facts and they continue to help make my scripted videos that much better and they're also over here popping me with some hot facts as well so um yeah so thank you again to those to you to my patron patrons i i almost will cry if i when i really think about it but your support means the absolute world to me so thank you so much um rob jones thank you great show i literally can't wait for falcon heavy Got to sleep. Good night. And good night to you, Rob Jones. Thank you so much for your tips. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I as well cannot wait for Falcon Heavy. So, oh, awesome. Germany, German exchange student. Hello. Uh, methane is greener than current fuel. That is true. Methane, its only byproduct is water and carbon, but it's easy to absorb carbon. It's, it's very clean. It's not um, very sooty. So, how do I get a model behind you? These are Ollie Bronze, um, buzzspacemodels.com. Uh, we can get a link to that going here. Our mods will probably throw that up quick. So, <laughs> uh, Max Loboya, thank you. Go grab a beer now, thank you. I'll have to wait until I finish shooting the rest of this upcoming video that I'm trying to get out before I go down to Falcon Heavy, which means I have probably two or three more hours of shooting and then probably 20 hours of editing. I'm doing a lot of After Effects animations for this video which always take for freaking ever. So I'm not very excited about that, but hopefully it provides good information for people. Um, so maybe after that, maybe I'll, I'll take you up on that beer. So thank you very much. Lee Roberts, hello from UK. Keep up the great work. Is Falcon Heavy Payload Bay larger or larger in volume than Fairing 9 or different fairings? Great question, Lee. Very good question. The fairings are all the same. They actually currently just have a standard fairing. Um, it's expensive to make different fairings. It's kind of, SpaceX is all about keeping 
things in unison. That's why the Falcon Heavy uses the same Merlin engines as the Falcon 9. That's why they use the same cores, essentially. That's why they use the same tooling. Um, they only have one standard payload fairing. And the Falcon Heavy has the same one. And it's not so much volume capped. You know, the Falcon 9, a lot of satellites can be heavier than what Falcon 9 is currently capable of, of launching um, and be in that similar volume. So it's not necessarily a volume thing. There are some satellites that will not be able to fly on Falcon Heavy because they are simply too big, such as, um, for instance, what is that? The BA-330, um, Bigelow's, Bigelow Aerospace's expandable HAB module, I believe would not be able to fit inside a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy payload fairing. So it has to fly on a bigger um, five meter fairing, like on an Atlas V. So there are limitations, but it's very rare actually for a satellite or a payload to ex exceed uh, SpaceX's payload fairing size, and typically the only limitations are our mass and not so much payload fairing size. So, um, will the second stage stay there on the transfer orbit? So, basically, uh, yeah, the upper stage and the payload will basically drift together, but the, the satellite will end up, again, inserting itself into its geostationary orbit rather quickly. Um, the BA-330 needs a 7-meter fairing. SpaceX is 5-meter. Thank you, Ollie Braun. Ollie Braun, the wizard behind these. That's correct. Yeah, 7 and 5 meters. 7-meter fairing is huge. That is very, very, very wide. SpaceX's fairing is that common 5-meter. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. You're welcome, Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's always fun to say. The launch is over, Daniel Stewart. You missed it, but you can replay it here, either when I end here or watch SpaceX's live stream as well. Um, what's the diameter of these globes behind me? I don't know the exact size. They're, I don't know, five or six inches, X amount of centimeters, about this big. Hopefully that gives you a better sense of scale. So yeah, that's those are those MOVA globes. I love those things, they're very, very cool. Wow, thank you, Vadim. Thank you so much for that tip. That means a lot, thank you, and hello. Okay, so, um, we had a few more. Oh, there we go, what happens if Falcon Heavy will fail? Uh, what effect would that have on SpaceX slash Falcon 9? That's a very good question. And it, it, the answer is it depends. Um, so there's a lot of things that are completely unique to Falcon Heavy that would have no effect on Falcon 9. Say there's some extreme vibration that ends up tearing the vehicle apart that is entirely unique, some harmonic imbalance or something in between those three cores that ends up shaking it to death. That's unique to Falcon Heavy. That would not affect Falcon 9. Of course, they'll do probably a little bit of a review, but if they know immediately, oh, this is a Falcon Heavy thing or booster separation. Falcon 9 doesn't need to worry about booster separation, so say something would fail there, that would not affect Falcon 9. But now say an engine fails, or a fuel pump fails, or uh, uh, you know tank ruptures, or an upper stage, things that are common with Falcon 9, if it shares a common lineage, it would have to stand down as well. So just because Falcon Heavy is risky doesn't necessarily mean it risks Falcon 9. They might be able to resume almost immediately, um, and depending on where and what failed. So we'll just have to pay attention and really hope for the best. Oh, I, I just can't wait. I cannot wait. I am scared and I am terrified. Robert, could a Falcon Heavy two have, have Heavy's two extra boosters have two Dragon capsules on them for an awesome thrill ride? You know, Robert, technically, yes. Uh, that's very interesting, but one of the issues here, it's, it's pretty well frowned upon these days, post-shuttle era, to ever have a crew vessel um, adjacent or next to fuel tanks. So if the if the Falcon Heavy's booster, right here, these little whomp, and right here, if there were two uh, Dragon vessels there that you know could pop off and, and people could get a little joyride on them, um, if they were to have an, an issue need to abort, they would be really dangerously close to other things where they'd run into the upper stage or the payload fairing or whatever it may be. Um, uh, in theory, yes, they could do it. It'd be very Kerbal of them, but they probably will never be doing anything like that. But I like that idea. Um, did SES deploy? Yes, uh, SES deployed successfully. They had a successful payload fairing. So um, there we go. <laughs> so here we go. Where do I get these globes again? MovaGlobes.com or MovaInternational.com, I believe. 
Uh, what happens to the second stage after deployment? When there's room and when there's extra fuel on board, they purposely will deorbit it so it burns up and crashes into the ocean. Um, again, we do need to remember that one of the worst things you can put in the ocean is plastic, and these are primarily aluminum, which actually isn't the worst thing in the world to put into the ocean. So, although it is sort of littering, uh, it does decompose rather quickly and is, is not a big deal, so. All right, um, again, if you have questions about when SpaceX will do anything, including when will they launch this, when will they launch that, including when will they launch Falcon Heavy, you need the SpaceX Now app, so pay attention here. Uh, to the, there will be a, a thing that reminds you every five minutes. If you want to stay on top of things, get the app SpaceX now. Um, let's see here. Has the blood moon happened in America? Uh, yes, the blood moon happened this morning. Um, it was fun. I did a live stream of it. It was very long. It was like three hours long. And I woke up at 4.30 a.m. this morning. I'm on the weirdest schedule today, guys. So, um, let's see here. Yeah, metal is okay. So Mike368 says, on GTO missions, they leave the upper stage there. I I think I agree with you, but I, I would actually be surprised if they do that, because all they have to do to, to deorbit the upper stage in uh, a GTO mission is when it's at its highest point, they have to do a small burn to lower the lowest point and then re-enter there as well. Um, yeah. Uh, Naveed Sheriff, why am I not in my astronaut suit? I believe that was Naveed. Um, you can, <laughs> it's very hot. You can watch my video, how, is, how I almost died in a spacesuit three times, or how a spacesuit almost killed me three times. It explains about how uncomfortable the suit is and why I very, 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 very much hate to put that thing on. So, um, somebody asked what rocket it was that had the seven meter fairing. That is the Atlas V. Um, they can use up to a seven meter fairing, and, it's, and that's very, very big. Um, I think the Delta IV can also do a seven meter fairing as well. What was the purpose of the landing legs? Um, to be to be perfectly honest, I still don't have the right answer on why they ended up keeping the landing legs on a booster that was going to be um, expended. Uh, some speculation is that they were testing, you know, making sure to go over all their numbers and you know just kind of coming in with extra hot reentry profiles or things that they wanted to test out uh, where the aerodynamic properties of having those landing legs matters. There's a chance. Totally making this up. Don't take this out of context, but just speculating. Maybe they took the innards out of the landing legs and they... No, because they said landing legs deployed. Wrong. So, I don't exactly know why, other than um, maybe it's new old stock as well. Because if you think about it, the, the Block 5 will have different landing legs. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it was a reused rocket, but at the same time, the, the legs, I believe, were brand new. So... Um, are SpaceX working on ion engines? Not really, that's more of the payload's job to be doing. Um, ion engines are awesome, but they're very, very, very low thrust, so the uh, spacecraft that uses ion engines needs to already be in space, and that's SpaceX's job, is to get things in space. So there we go. And Falcon Heavy bumped uh, this booster for being recovered, because they, they, they're only, what, six days apart right now? Um, this launch and Falcon Heavy, that wouldn't be enough time for the boat to go out to sea and come back and then go back out again. So um, I think they're more worried about trying to land all three cores of Falcon Heavy 2. That is definitely um, definitely something to, yeah. Any new information on Zuma? Yeah, actually, uh, basically that everything went fine on SpaceX's end. And they even, NASA reiterated that and so did the Air Force basically. So yeah. How do they light up the second stage? There's uh, there's the same ignition process as lighting up the the first stage engines. It's called TTEB, triethyl aluminum, triethyl boring. It's a hypergolic, two two fluids that they basically spray at each other, and when they come in contact, they they themselves ignite a little bit, and then they start uh, using that to ignite the engines. So it's just this thing that are it's a pressurized gas that comes in contact right at the in, inside the engine chamber. They light that up, um, and then they light up the engines. So that's how they, they do ignition. So, T-Tab. It is over. Uh, if I, I will do a meetup at IEC if I come. Absolutely, Finn. Absolutely. Um, why didn't they show first stage splashdown? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. Maybe because they don't need to. <laughs> uh... 
Let's see here. I'm trying to answer a few more, but then guys, I do have to get going. I will be finishing the video so that I can get it out before I leave for Florida to go see Falcon Heavy. Uh, let's see. So many thing was an attempt. Yeah, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's one more good question to answer here. Why did they do a landing burn? So again, they went through the motions of landing. Um, they had the margins to do it. And again, they're, they're always up for collecting data. So they may have pushed it harder. They may have gone in through the atmosphere hotter than they normally would if, you know, if they're trying to recover the stage. They may have pushed the envelope a little bit more or tried to extend the glide range or do all sorts of things. Um, they could have done any number of tests. And instead of just letting it fall and totally be useless, at least they were able to gain data out of it. So, um, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out well, what are some of my favorite books? Ivan wants to know. Uh, I like audiobooks. Uh, John Young has a good one, Forever Young. I really like Elon Musk's audio biography. It's very inspirational. I really like Buzz Aldrin's um, Mission to Mars. Robert Zubrin has an awesome book about Mars. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's book is, a, uh, well, there's one, one of Neil deGrasse Tyson's I really like. I, I'm not so much into astrophysics as you guys might know. I'm, I'm more into space exploration. I forget which one he has that I have that's specifically more about space exploration, but that one was awesome. Um, there we go. So I think, can you breathe on Mars? You could technically breathe. Uh, it's only 1% atmosphere and it's not something that's going to keep you alive, but you'd be able to breathe in the 1% atmosphere. That's very, uh, I believe it's nitrogen rich. I'm not, again, I'm not very good at this stuff. This is beyond my expertise, but um, yeah, it, it, you, you wouldn't survive, but you could surely breathe. It just wouldn't be good or keep you alive and you'd actually die very, 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 very quickly. So there, um, this already happened. They are not GoPros. SpaceX doesn't use GoPros. Um, they're similar to GoPros, but they are not. Um, do I have a boring flamethrower, boring company flamethrower? Uh, yes. So there we go, guys. <laughs> Astrophysics for people in a hurry. That's the book by Tyson. I don't. That's the one I don't like actually, because that one, that one's specifically about astrophysics. He has another one that talks a lot more about exploration, and I really like that for, from Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um. Pure, purely carbon dioxide, yeah, you would not be very happy. Um, can the legs be reused or re retracted? Um, with Block 5, they will be retractable legs. So right now, once they deploy, they're a one-way mechanism, and SpaceX has to manually unbolt them and, and fold them up and transport them and do whatever they do with them on current Block 3 slash Block 4 Falcon 9s. Block 5, though, will have retractable and reusable landing legs. So one is Block 5 launching, hopefully this year so um and it sounds like maybe late spring so i'm thinking i'm hearing like maybe april may maybe even later so there we go um and again let's reiterate one more time here i'm gonna do a wrap up and then i'm gonna tune out so i can finish up the video and hopefully have that out here like thursday night or friday so to reiterate today spacex successfully launched um ses 16 slash govsat one this was a geostationary orbit mission where they launched a 4200 kilogram mission uh or uh payload up to uh up to geostationary transfer orbit using a, a reused falcon 9 booster it first this same booster first flew on nro nrol 76 and it was not attempted to recover. They went through all the recovering process that even had landing legs and grid fins and nitrogen thrusters, but they did not recover it. Um, and for many, many reasons that you can hear before, I, I talk about it a lot at the beginning of this video. So when I go offline, go ahead and refresh and rewatch it. You'll learn the exact reasons and speculations on why they are not reusing it, but it was perfectly successful. So, uh, and here we go. Thank you, Mark Schmidt for your tip. Hey Tim, I'm in Florida. Can I watch Falcon Heavy in real life? If you're there through Tuesday, uh, maybe a few days later if it scrubs, um, absolutely, you can watch it. And that's what my video coming out before I leave is all about, is where you can watch Falcon Heavy um, and other SpaceX and other rocket launches. So stay tuned to that. I will have that up as soon as possible. That's why I'm gonna sign off here, guys, is so I can continue working on that video. So I just, again, one more time, I wanna thank my Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. We're almost up to 300, which means we'll be doing another giveaway of a piece of flown space shuttle discovery here. So again, that is, a piece of space shuttle 
Uh, we already owe 200. I was going to be doing that giveaway once the Patreons have all uh, been billed. We're going to be doing that giveaway at Falcon Heavy. There's a chance we might get to 300 Patreon members. Um, so I'll have to do another giveaway. I have two more pieces left. So here we go. So if you're one of the first 300, you have a chance to win a piece of Spatial Discovery. So thank you for my Patreons. Thanks to those patrons in the Discord channel for helping me script and research. You guys are amazing. Reminder, you can get your own uh, Everyday Astronaut shirts and hats and mugs and prints of rocket launches and prints of my uh, Instagram pictures and things like that, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Uh, check that out if you want. Um, they make great pictures to hang on your walls, I promise. Or things to wear on your body. Whatever you want to do with them. I don't know. Um, thank you guys so much. I Next time you hear from me live, I will probably be down in Florida. Uh, live streaming, hopefully, as long as everything's going well with Falcon Heavy. So get ready for that. Stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed so you know when I do that. It'll be very, very, very exciting. So, all right. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for sticking around. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for all the great tips. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you guys. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, guys. I think we all dreamt about going to space when we were kids. But when the space shuttle program ended in 2011, I discovered a void in my life. That emptiness led to a newfound obsession with space. A few years later, I wound up bidding on a Russian spacesuit as a joke. When the box arrived at my doorstep, my friends asked, what are you gonna do with a spacesuit? The answer, what can't I do with a spacesuit? That's how Everyday Astronaut was born. Since then, the suit hasn't left my side. It's even gone around the world with me. From remote villages in Myanmar, rockets and spaceships. To beautiful fields in Norway. I'm fighting a cow to get a picture right now. Here I am on vacation in the beautiful Norway with my beautiful I even proposed to my wife in the suit at Machu Picchu in Peru. These days I've worked with leaders in the space industry to create fun and inspirational content. I've even been invited to different NASA facilities across the country, all for the sake of sharing my excitement with the world. Hey there, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Now I'm not sure if you're aware, but NASA is doing some incredible This is... This is church for us space nerds. This is where Gene Kranz was sitting when people first met him. This is with permission. I still don't know how. I love that I'm standing on something that says urine bags. This thing's gonna fly like a cat and eat. Whatever that means. That dog's gonna have a sore throat by the end of the day, I'll tell you that. Especially once he tries to explain to his friends that he just saw an astronaut flying majestically through the sky for an hour. This thing has officially become the bane of my existence. Everyday Astronaut's mission is to bring space down to Earth for everyday people. To communicate science through humor and imagination. But most importantly, to spark your curiosity, to want to find your place in the cosmos. Join my adventures as I seek to find out why exploring space is important, inspiring, and quite frankly, really, really neat. Show your support by visiting patreon.com slash everydayastronaut.